Art of Relationships Radio Show is copyrighted. No one is to use any part of the show without express written consent from myself, Greg Tuzinski, or the Art of Relationships. Thank you. Welcome to the Art of Relationships Radio Show. Greg welcomes live calls from listeners in helping with numerous marital and relationship problems. There will be no more tit-for-tat arguments. Greg gets to the root of couples' challenges in a rapid, matter-of-fact format, plus applies compassion and humor. Join in discovering how to improve your relationship and your own life. Listen, laugh, and climax. Greg is a licensed professional counselor in the state of Michigan. <coughs> to others, he's simply known as Detroit's <coughs> love guru. <laughs> Hey people, welcome. This is the Art of Relationships Radio Show. I'm your host as always, uh, Greg Dzinski, Detroit's love guru. I'm a licensed professional counselor in the state of Michigan, a relationship and sex specialist. And welcome to all those people that are new ooh, to the show. Welcome. We are doing, you know, first of all, my heart goes out and my deepest wishes go out to those people of Texas in Louisiana that are, let's face it, they're devastated um, with the Hurricane Harvey, okay? Harvey was, or is still, a bastard, okay? So my best wishes go out. I got uh, quite a few friends that are affected in the Houston, southern Texas area. So my best wishes to them, their family, their loved ones. And it's very difficult, you know, when we're sitting here in Michigan, we don't have to um, you know, we, we get maybe a little bit of rain, an inch, they're getting feet. <laughs> um, you know, we get snowstorms in the winter or whatever. They're devastated. Their houses, you know, they're swept away. So my heart, uh, deepest wishes, thoughts and prayers go out to those people uh, affected by Hurricane Harvey. Um, and also loved ones that have, you know, let's face it, family loved ones that are uh, down in Texas that are being in Louisiana that are being affected to everybody else okay so this show tonight is dedicated to all those people down there and we're going to be talking about you know talking about you know hurricane not to be a downer or not to be so much of um you know a bummer of a mood type aspect with the show because people you know know me i love to laugh joke around with during shows but i want to talk about bad times okay i want to talk about how do you know? Everybody, you know, we talk about relationships. When everything is going smooth, everything is going great, everything, you know, it's rocking and rolling, everything is fantastic. What happens in the bad times? And can you depend on your partner? Can you depend on your loved one to be there for you in times of crisis? Okay. So, you know, talking about would you just say, you know, peace out, I'm out of here, like Hurricane Harvey. You know what, you want to stay behind, I'm out of here, whatever. You know, what do you do and when do you decide to hold on to your own self? Meaning, you know, maybe your own values, your own morals, and you're not going to sell those out. But, you know, what happens when you're in a time of crisis, when the things don't go well? Say, you know, one of you is sick, you're diagnosed with cancer. Maybe, you know, knock on wood, no one, you know, out there listening, you know, has you know ms or muscular dystrophy and you come down with that or lupus you know i get you know quite a few clients you know over the years that are you know women that are females diagnosed with lupus and you know maybe the progression of that disease you know would you be there would you be there for each other in those bad times and you know it's a very you know sort of gut check of a question and what would it take for you to be able to be there for your partner would you be there for them or you know what would you also would you want them to be there for you in those moments okay jessica glenda cynthia's in the house welcome oh kim welcome peace so you know in those bad times you look at you know you do a gut check and you know we're i was texting with uh, actually cynthia earlier today and I hope, you know, my we're talking about bad things. My best wishes go out to Cynthia and everything, too. So I hope you're feeling well, um, you know, after your ordeal yesterday. So um, best wishes to you. So we're talking, you know, texting back and forth and looking at, <clears throat> you know, do you know? You sit there and, you know what, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be by my lover's side. And then, you know, if the shit hits the fan, 
Will you be there? And how do you how do you work together during those bad times? Even you know the bad times can not only during a crisis like you know Hurricane Harvey, you know, or maybe you know when you get sick. And I'm not talking the flu. We could talk about you know the flu, the cold. Maybe you've had a surgery, and you know you're depending on your partner to help out to be there for you. And they're like, peace. I'm you know what? You're fine. You're in bed. I'm getting out of here. You know what? You, and you talk about, you know, the ordeal and talking about the level of trust that you have for each other, that you're going to be able to be there for one another in good times and in bad, okay? And that it has no bearing on being married, okay, people? This is about being in a committed relationship. Yeah, you can tie it into a marriage aspect, whatever, too. But in relationship dynamics, you know, if you're in a committed relationship, can you trust your partner to be there through thick and thin? And another element is, you know what? Who decides what thick and thin is? You know what? Is it me? Is it, you know, you? Thick and thin is very subjective. And, you know, we're not talking about are you there no matter what if your partner, um, say, has an addiction. We could get on all those aspects, too. Um, <laughs> Amy talks about, Amy, welcome, uh, mentioned about, you know, a crony there, and she's got Crohn's, you know, thanks for sharing that, too, I knew that, but, um, sharing it with the, you know, aspect, and does that partner really exist, Emily's in the house, we've got a lot of people going on, so it's very, very difficult and very challenging, you know, are you going to be there for one another, and are there limits, and can you sit there, you know what, no matter what, I'm going to be there for my partner, no matter if they're laid up in bed for three months, you know, fighting, you know, maybe they've had to have a liver transplant plan or have a kidney dissected or removed. And these aspects, you know, we're hitting on, you know, illnesses and, you know, times of crisis. But we're going to, you know, later on in the show, we're going to go into during the bad times when you feel like you hate each other and without selling yourself out. So we're going to get into those dynamics as well. <clears throat> Excuse me, the second half of the show, okay? James, welcome. Oh, my God, we have not been here in all. Yeah, I haven't seen you in a while. Welcome back. Um, James, you mentioned illness is actually the reason that a long-distance best friend became much more and eventually my wife. You know what? That, that's an interesting you know, story. She was having difficulty with epilepsy, and this is a new one because epilepsy, for people that don't know it, if you have severe epilepsy, you might be bound. You you cannot drive. They will, or they're supposed to, you know, revoke your driver's license where you're epilepsy, you know, epileptic free for, you know, I think each state is different. And I know Michigan, it's a minimum of six months. Even, I think they might even change it to a year where your episode, you know, ep, an epilepsy, epileptic, sorry, episode, you're free for six months, and I think they changed it to a year. So imagine what the heck that would do to you um, in your lifestyle. And, you know, we talk about, I've mentioned this on numerous shows before, my biggest fear is being a burden on somebody else, okay? So, you know, what are you going to do to be that? So, you know, I moved 650 miles to come help her out. Shortly after, she asked me to never leave. Now, you know, are we looking at it? There's a point on wanting to be there in love. How many people would remain in those situations because out of obligation or that you actually love your partner? And it, this is a very subjective question, and it's not a right, wrong type of situation. You know, we you get into if somebody is addicted to heroin, addicted or alcoholic, you know, that type of aspect. You know what? How long would you stay and should you stay? You know, the big deal, you know, death do us part type of aspect through the good times and bad times. What does that actually mean? And do you have boundaries what those should be? You know, a self-inflicted illness like, um, you know, not even if some people, you know, even a illness type aspect. Is it really an addiction? Is that an illness or, you know what, you just didn't stop yourself before it became an addiction? You know, we can throw that out there and go round and round with that aspect about, you know, is it a disease, is it an illness, you know, somebody having epilepsy. You know, it wasn't their choice to have epilepsy. You know, we can, you know, cancer, we can get, you know, into a lot of other aspects. It wasn't something that you inflicted or wished upon yourself, um, 
you know, Crohn's disease. That's something that, you know what, you did not, you know what, you're not doing anything to cause you to have Crohn's disease. You know, all these elements you look at, you know, so we can, maybe that'll be another show, addiction. Is it an illness? Is it a choice? You know, and I get stresses. I get life stresses, horrific ordeals and traumas throughout your life, you know, could definitely lead to an addiction. I get that. I'm not saying that. But you look at are there other elements and maybe you don't think there are and it just becomes an addiction, that type of aspect. But you look at um, not just weather or sickness, but jail or rehab. Ooh, Kim, this is a good point. And do you look at, you know, through good times and bad times, when you mention, um, you know, when you mention that aspect that you, oh, Sophia, thank you, Caesar free for six months to drive. I, I thought that was the case, but um, <laughs> Kim Wilton said, you need coffee. You know what, Kim? I got coffee right here. I know, I'm tired, long day. I need a break. Actually, this weekend, I'm taking off. So if anybody in the Metro Detroit area has any plans, wants to go out, buy me a couple of drinks, dinner, lunch, let me, let me know. <laughs> Get a hold of me, okay? Um, you look at the element to where, um, you know, the addiction aspects, and you look at those elements to where, you know what, through jail or rehab, would you be there, would you not? And do you set limits for yourself? And how do you, you know, in those times of needs and crisis, do you look at what happens if, you know what, we all make mistakes, right? I get, you know, there's a lot of people that they shouldn't, but they drink and drive one time, they'll never do it again, whatever, they're in jail, and you're going to be, I get that. But what happens, do you set limits on if it happens again, say you're in rehab two, three, four, five, six, seven times, does that mean you should always be there for that person no matter what? This is a very delicate subject. Hey, Chris, welcome. Chris is in the house. <laughs> um, you look at the elements and, you know, should you set boundaries and you should you set limits as far as what to look for those situations, okay? Um, and... You know, would you be able to do that? Should you do that? Or do you sell yourself out? And there's that guilt. Um, you know, it could be religious guilt. It could be how we're raised. You know what? Good times, bad times. No matter what, if they're an, addic you know, an addiction, I'm going to be by their side no matter what. Or they keep ending up in and out of jail all the time. You know, do you still stick by their side? Me? You know what? If it's a chronic thing, I'm going to say I'm going to help you. But if you're not helping yourself, whatever... You know what, that's where maybe my self-love, and it's not, if you want to call it selfish out there, you know what, I'm going to be there, and I'm going to bust my ass to help you. If you're not helping yourself, do you look for that situation to where, you know what, peace out. That I love myself, and I have respect for myself not to do that. And if that person doesn't have that respect and love for me to maybe get help or whatever, you know what, is that being selfish on my part? And I'd love to hear that. Uh, Cynthia, you mentioned it. Yeah, I, after battling two types of cancer over the last four years, I find myself telling my husband to move on. And um, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to get into this. Cynthia has been a friend of mine for a long time. Her and her husband John, um, they're great people. And the battle, you know, you go through, and I know this was a big joke uh, for Cynthia, and I'm not, I don't want to get into your business too much, but we joke about this, and I had to tell her to stop uh, one aspect about moving on, you know, from cancer and all this stuff, and I, um, if she wants to write it up and disclose what she had planned for her husband, or what she wanted to help him do after she passes, um, you know, what, I, I got on her ass and said, you need to stop, you know, because he might not want that. I know you want that, but you he might not want that. So I'll let her, if she wants to disclose that, she can go ahead in the chat below. But I'm not going to air out everything, okay? And I know, um, and Cynthia, a lot of people don't know, you know her story. And I appreciate you coming out here because it's going to help. You know, it is the essence of going through good times and bad times. Her and her husband, John. And I can't speak enough about the strength that they have that they're there for, you know, each other and her husband's there for her with, you know, all the shit that she's been going through with the rare uh, rare types of cancer. And it, it's uh, not that it's perfect. You know, she's going to type in, Greg, we're not per I know you're not perfect. 
but the essence of you know being there for yourself and you look at you know through all the multiple surgeries and all this stuff and knowing that um you know the cancer is there's no cure for what she has okay so knowing you know that person might not be here a year from now six months from now you know what do you do and would you be able to be there or you know what would you and it's a matter is it strength is it a matter of courage hell yeah absolutely and to be able to you know sort of live your life and still connect even on a deeper level in those times of need that's why i said you know with you know a cancer that was not caused you know wasn't smoking wasn't it was you know just a rare form of cancer it's not caused you know people get liver cancer from drinking um that type of aspect you know it's some a lot of cancers aren't caused by from smoking and they live a clean healthy life and you get cancer and you look at these elements are you able to would you be there for that aspect um would you be able to be there and you know what all those elements could you do that and chris you mentioned you had a head injury with a bleed and a fire seizure for 18 months no when the heck was chris was that um did that happen recently or was that many years ago um when you said that and thanks for disclosing that and it's six months so it must be six months seizure free and i appreciate that so um you look at the element to where you know would you be there and say someone was in a fire you know we we get all these aspects and are you able to be in a fire the situation to where you know what would you be with somebody after if they had third degree burns and their face was deformed and those type of aspects and this is a gut check that you look at the elements to where you know what during the bad times would you be there or you know they have maybe both their legs amputated or you know those type of, from an illness whatever uh diabetes aspects sometimes they have to have you know amputations unfortunately because diabetes got out of the hand maybe they didn't take care of themselves or it just was you know a quick onset of the diabetes just kicked in and took over and there was nothing that they could do so it's very difficult would you be able to be there with that person or not so uh kim you mentioned the after part is what me and mine are having a hard time with i handle a lot of his things an adjustment to you know after is what we're having a hard time with trying to get back to the basics and part of you know the basics when you're talking um, depending on the situation, you know, you get not only the fear that maybe if someone has an addiction or whatever or cancer, the biggest fear is, is it going to come back or, you know, relapse, right? And it's, you know, you could use the word relapse in cancer. You can use relapse in addictions big time, which happens a lot. So, you know, the big fear is you work on this, and I'm glad you brought this up, Kim, that, you know, a the big fear is I think everyone is walking on eggshells to see if this is going to happen. I don't want to think, you know, cancer, we're, you know, in remission, everything's great, everything, woohoo, no more cancer. And all of a sudden, in the back of your head, or maybe not even in the back of your head, it's right here up front, you're wondering and you're walking on eggshells thinking what happens if it comes back. So are you willing, do you cut off your emotions, right? Do you desensitize your emotion and your love for a person? Because let's face it, it hurts. It, it you know, maybe rips you apart for you seeing your loved one struggle and also what you deal with. Not, you know, when somebody is sick or addiction, you have kids and all these aspects. You know, you might have one person doing everything. And, you know, grocery shopping, cooking, laundry household chores all these aspects it, people don't look at these elements to where um you know that goes into this you know in the you know would you be willing to hang on there are you doing that and is it selfish not to and i know you know cynthia talking about cynthia and you know her bout with cancer you look at night cynthia is um she's got a huge heart she's stubborn as hell she knows that and she's okay with me saying it she's stubborn as hell and um she you know hates sitting still always wants to be busy always has these goals that she wants to accomplish so you know are you able you know everybody is different some people will you know fall down and you know i don't want to you know the victim role but they'll feel sorry for themselves it's hard it's hard not to and just be afraid to do anything okay so you look at it would you be there for that person what would you do to care for them 
And, you know, you're thinking, oh, it's a week, two weeks. It might not be bad. But what happens in the bad times if it happens to be three months, six months? What if it's, you know, unfortunately, they're diagnosed, you know, with MS, whatever, and they're bound in a wheelchair. And, you know, they can't take care of themselves that well. What, you know, what would you do? And it's very difficult. You can sit there and say this, people. I can even say this because you look at, you know, I'm going to be there no matter what. And then you start doing it. And all of a sudden, it, you know, that one week turns into one month, turns into six months, maybe a year. And would you be able to do that? And I, you know, mentioned about the burn aspects and the disfigurations. You know, it, it's hard. It's very difficult. And I'm not, I don't judge anybody. Um, you know, sometimes maybe because of what I've done for all these years, I see, you know, different compassions and different limits that people have. And is it right? Is it wrong? Is it bad? Or is it just, you know what? You get it and you understand it. Not that you have to like it, okay? So go on, uh, James. You mentioned uh, the most common and trying testing illness I know of is anxiety. You know what, James? Um, this is, I'm going to. This causes a lot of relationship issues. Um, I, 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 absolutely. The anxiety causes a lot of issues, whatever. Often things done or said are pervasive actions, but for most, human nature is to think it's what the sufferer is saying or doing. You know what? That's great, James. That's a great point. Despite it's not being within their control, it's seldom brought up with relationship professionals. But, James, I'm going to tell you, this is awesome that you're bringing it up anxiety i deal with anxiety a lot with my clients okay he has severe anxiety um she has maybe severe anxiety and it sets in with paranoia not only you know and it when they have kids or you know the anxiety sets in with the kids getting hurt and you talk about the helicopter pilot or the anxiety that you know creates about self-esteem and you know, the paranoia about the anxiety with body image issues and, you know, the cheating aspect or afraid to socialize, afraid it affects everybody and it, it's very, very difficult. And you look to the, you know, to the partner and you look at, okay, how much I get that they're there and what do you do for it? So you're right. I think a lot of people, relationship professionals, not me, um, I look at the effects and how can you sue that and how can you be there a team together? Now, can you fight the anxiety together as a team or do you just, okay, that's your issue to deal with? And, you know, I know, James, you heard me talking a while ago and, you know, everybody else heard me talking about, um, you know, that, you know, with people with, say, erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation, females with vaginismus, you know what, that's your issue to handle and, you know, that's it. You know, I'm leaving whatever, you fix it. You know what? You try to be a team as long as you can. I'm going to say that, you know, you try to work together as a team, and that's through the bad times, okay? That's the essence of tonight's show, being there through the bad times and what your limit is. And with the anxiety, it creates a lot of havoc. It could be, you know, anxiety because maybe the person is calling the other one for reassurance all day long and they have work to do. And, you know, they're on the phone and all of a sudden their job is in jeopardy because you're trying to soothe your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your partner, your, you know, your husband, you know, or wife. You're trying to soothe them all the time and your job is in jeopardy. And a lot of people don't realize that. And that's, I'm, you know, that's a reality. I'm telling you it's happened to a few more than a few clients um, that I've worked with. So, you know what, it's very, very difficult you know, to deal with when, you know, maybe you're dealing with this and your job is on the line. It, it's so very, very difficult. And I'm glad you brought that up, James, about the anxiety and everything, okay? So you look at, you look at the elements to where, you know, what works for you, what doesn't, and it, it's hard. It's very difficult. And everyone is easy to point a finger at you and say, you should do this. You need to do that. You need to do this. They're not living in your shoes, you know. I would do this. I would do this. You know what? That's them. And it's very difficult. You look at people judging in those situations, judging you. Or you maybe you're judging other people. Maybe you're one of them. I would do this. I can't believe they did that. They would leave. They would do this in this time of need. It, it's very difficult. And it, it tends to be very subjective, okay. Um, and mention, yeah, someone, you know, was on double vent pneumonia for nine days. 
uh, 16 days total in the hospital. I didn't see my bed till he got released. It was an eye opener because I had no power since we aren't married to even sign, you know, um, you know, maybe sign a power of attorney. We'll say that, you know, power of attorney, medical, you know, power of attorney, that type of aspect to make decisions. And you're right in those situations. If you're not married, man, you're screwed if you don't have that <clears throat> to make medical decisions. So that's something else to look at, okay? And the elements you, you need to look at to where, you know, how much do you do? And what happens, you know, you look there and you expect your per partner, right, to be there for you. You know, you've been through them battling with cancer or surgeries or sicknesses, illness, you all that, and then you get sick and you find out they're like, peace out, I'm out of here. And you're like, damn, what the hell, I busted my ass, I'm there for you, but you're not there for me. And this is where you, maybe you learn a lesson and you look at, you know what, I'm not going to be there anymore. I want somebody that's going to be there for me, and it's not just one-sided. Got it? And are you able to do that, or are you? do you have a, you know, a huge bleeding heart no matter what you're going to be there? But when they're there for you, what do you do? They're not there, right? They have excuses. They're this, they're that, whatever, okay? The excuses start flying. Then you feel you're not important. You get pissed off, whatever. But then, guess what? Maybe you get through that. Then something else happens. And again, they're not there for you. And now what do you do? right? Should you stay in that environment? I'm going to say that's your decision, not mine to make. That is your decision. The one thing I'm going to tell you, if you bitch and complain that they're never there for you and you're still staying in that environment, then you need to stop complaining about that or maybe do something about that, okay? it's Again, it's not easy. I get that. But it gives you a little perspective about what's going on and how much control or power you have within yourself and about self-respect and self-love, okay? Um, Natalia mentioned, yes, I agree. They need us. I was with my mother till her last breath. You know what? This this is another, you know, it, it's very difficult. And you look at um, when we have loved ones, you know, it, you know, aging parents, and maybe they're in and out of the hospital, nursing home. They're in hospice. And I had an aunt that um, took care of her, her father, her and her brother, for like five to seven years, she would spend a week there. Her brother would spend a week. They would go back and forth for five to seven years like this for their dad. And you look at how much you can be there for a lot, and you get that. But what do you do, and how much does that affect maybe if you're a parent raising your kids? Um, you know, what's that do for your marriage and your relationship? It's it, it it's a delicate balance, people. It's we're always supposed to be there for our loved ones, but do we set boundaries? Do we you know what do we do? And it, it's very difficult. You you know it's one of those things. You know you have a bleeding heart because they're caring for their loved one, but yet then you feel you, you can understand that. But then you start feeling neglected, alone, whatever, not a priority. You understand it, but then maybe after a certain amount of time, six months, a year, whatever. You know, what starts happening, okay? Um, Emily, you mentioned um, it is difficult. That isn't, you know, it, it, it is difficult. It understood to be a caregiver as well. I am a nurse as well, so know both sides of the fences. Emily, that's a great perspective, and it's difficult because we can step back and look at, even me, from clients, you know, whatever. With me, I, I get attached to my clients, okay? I care. I care about people. I care about my clients, the people I help, um, well, people in general, and I'm invested, okay? It's not just a business for me. I actually care, okay? So, you know, I can still step back from that emotionally, and we look at, you know, we. I ask myself, and maybe you do too, Emily, since you're a nurse, you know what? Damn, what would I do in this situation? You know, would I be putting up with this? Would I, you know, we ask ourselves, all these questions or maybe we should because maybe some people don't and it puts a very very difficult perspective in you know when we're there when we see it versus you know from the outside versus when we're living it so it's very very difficult okay so you know as far as judging those situations and what's bad what do you do what do you tolerate it's not easy people not at all okay oh i forgot you can also give me a call 
It's in the header above, but I forgot. Uh, 313-614-9498. And you can put your comments in, uh, you know, below, too. Um, Susan's in the house. <coughs> uh, another longtime friend, uh, her and her husband. I'm fortunate to have a husband who is there for me. You don't have to lie about him, Susan. Not at all. I'm joking. I hope he's listening with you. Oh, oh, he might be working. Um, and vice versa. That's what marriage is. Taking care of your loved ones. You know, yes, it would be hard, but that's marriage. You know what? That's a great perspective, Susan. You both are there for each other. It's not just say, you know, your husband is, you know, never there for you, but you're always there for him. It isn't because you're, you know, you guys, you're there for each other. You have each other's backs. And, you know, I've witnessed it over, oh, my God, how many years has it been now? Um, but it's, you know, I've witnessed it, that you guys work as a team and you're there for each other. And that, that makes a big difference. The, the heartache and the problem is when one person isn't there, you want to call it being selfish or it's all about them. You know, it's almost like they get sick, they're the baby, and they want to be taken care of, but you're sick, you're on your own. And those type of relationships or marriages, they're going to run into problems. If, you know what, that's going to be a big reason that, you know what, that marriage or that relationship isn't going to last. So I agree. The big thing is that you both have to be there for each other, okay? And again, you know, you have to do a gut check as far as, what is enough for you? And we can, you know, we can get into a debate about, you know, addiction, you know, being, you know, alcoholic, being, um, you know, a heroin addict or a crack addict or whatever, okay? Maybe even a prescription drug. That's a huge epidemic throughout the whole country. Um, as far as, you know, the opiate addictions, painkillers, all that aspect. So it's very, very difficult. And how much is that you're always going to be there and how much is enough. And I'm not hearing, um, or I shouldn't say a hearing, I'm not seeing that much in the discussion, but what are your limits? And you know what? What? What is, what are your limits? I'm not seeing that much. Maybe people are very difficult when that goes on. Shauna, welcome. I sent her, <coughs> Shauna, um, and she's in a, uh, Houston, she's been a guest host on the show a few times. Uh, my deepest wishes, I don't know if you caught the show, I gave a huge shout out to people in Texas and Louisiana. And Shauna, I know you guys are flooded in around Houston. And I I mean, I appreciate you taking the time to sign in and listen to the show. Um, my heart, my you know, deepest wishes go out to you and your loved ones and your friends down there in Texas. And um, I know you were surprised that you even had power. But when you see anxiety coming on, you've got to try and develop coping systems for yourself and understand your triggers. Sean, you're absolutely right. And this is where, and I mentioned, I know you might have just caught on um, or just tuned in with the show. But this is where you want to, not only those coping mechanisms, but can your partner help you with them? Like I said earlier, can you be a team and work on the anxiety as a team instead of leaving, say, if you have anxiety, I have anxiety. You know what? I feel like I'm all alone with this, and I don't have help, and I have to do this alone. We all know it takes a lot of work to you know, deal with anxiety, and I'm glad James brought this up earlier. Um, and it's not fun. It, anxiety can wreak havoc on a relationship big time, anywhere from, you know, body image aspects, talk, going out and socializing, um, those type of aspects that you're always maybe paranoid and worried about everything, worried about the kid and, you know, where a uh, kid has a sneeze, oh my God, we got to go to the ER so it don't turn into pneumonia. You know, all these aspects with the anxiety, people don't realize that, yes, there's medications out there to help me. But that can be a hit or miss, too. And trying to realize, and it's very, very difficult. And the one thing, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder, which a lot of people might not know, that is an anxiety disorder. And that is the one medication that tends to have a huge biological component. That means if, you know what, people with just therapy, usually they need medication with full-blown OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, okay? 
chances are when they go off the meds, the OCD even come it comes right back. So it's very you know it's difficult. And what do you do to live with somebody like that? Um, you know it's very well. I'm trying to think of uh, what was the guy? They had a show and he was oh my god he did an awesome uh, had OCD monk I think it was. Yeah, he used to be on Taxi, and then he had his own show, Monk, and he had OCD. And he did, oh, my God, a textbook aspect about OCD. How would that be? How would you live with somebody with OCD? Would you do it? For how long? And you know what? We all have our breaking points. We all have our limits. And, you know, is that right or wrong? Or I think it's just a human condition, okay? So, Sean, yeah, anxiety goes hand-in-hand -hand with clinical depression, often misunderstood and can be dangerous. You're absolutely right. You see, there's, in, in my experience, and I know, Shauna, you're in school for this now, too. <clears throat> they say that a lot of times, anxiety, I see a lot of anxiety also with clinical depression, okay? I see that because you're so worried all the time. It makes you depressed. You know, you're worried. It wears you out. It stresses you out. And I've seen also clinical depression where, you know what, the anxiety is in a uh, that, that bad they don't really worry they just can't get out of that funk so I see more the anxiety along with clinical depression I don't see you know I, st I do see clinical depression with anxiety type aspect but I also you have to be careful I also see a lot of maybe clinical depression where you know, they stop caring about anything they don't worry about anything they're just depressed their motivation is just done it's you know their motivation is killed there you have no motivation and trying to, you know, help somebody with that can be very, very difficult. So you guys brought up some freaking great aspects. I appreciate your feedback. It help makes for a great show. So thank you so much, um, James. You brought. I, you mentioned. <coughs> excuse me. Um, I admit to being a hypocrite. Well, thanks for putting that out there. I don't want to become extra work, a burden or inconvenience to anybody. I'm, you know, you heard me say that too, James, but I refuse to not be there for family, friends, or especially my wife or any kids if they are ever sick or injured. Um, you know what? I, I agree. I, I'm the same way. We can, we might not want somebody there for us. And I think that's where, you know what, James, that you're not being a hypocrite. I, I say I'm the same way. It's one of those things, you know, we don't want anybody to worry about us. Maybe it's a man thing. I, who knows? <clears throat> but I don't want anyone to worry about me. I don't want to be a burden on anybody else, but I want to be there for my loved ones too. You know, I, you know, same thing. I want to be there. I want to care for them as much as I can, as much as possible. Um, and, you know, life and work and bills, you know, it's hard. It's not easy. You know, balancing everything. So I, I'm all about that. So I, it's not really you being a hypocrite. You know, being a hypocrite, if you want someone to care for you, James, it's all, you know, care for you, be for you, be there for you, whatever. But you're not going to be there for them. So I would say that's being a hypocrite. You not wanting anyone or, you know, being a burden to anybody else, that's not being a hypocrite. I, that's a different aspect, okay? So I get that. Um I, I don't want to be a burden. Then we look at, you know, do people want to take care of us? And you know what? Does it bring them joy? And does it make them feel needed and wanted to care for us or care for somebody, a loved one? And do we take that joy away from them? So, James, think about that a little bit, too. And it, it's a very, very delicate balance. And, again, everybody is different. So we look at, you know what, if they want to feel needed, do we take that away from them just because we don't want to be a burden? So it's it's a delicate, very subjective balance, if you will. And, you know, what do you do? Sorry. <clears throat> As you can tell, I'm not taking a break tonight. Needed a drink of water. Um, and you look at, um, oh, Rain Man, as far as with uh, Rain Man with autism. You brought up a great point, Emily. Um, you know, he had severe autism with Rain Man and um, the look for that. So that, that's, you know, that's huge. And James, you many learning and research helps to more fully understand. Understanding is being armed and prepared to better deal with it without making it worse. Then both can be more effectively developed skills to get through the anxiety. 
You know what? Well said, James. Um, you know what? I get that. And that, that's with anything. That's this with this with performance anxieties. Um, you know, well, talk about anxieties. You know, erectile dysfunction can be an anxiety if it's not a you know caused by medical problems or medication. Um, premature ejaculations. It's a performance anxiety. So there's. You're right. There's a lot of things that disrupt with anxiety. A lot of people take it for granted. They don't look at anxiety causing problems unless they're dealing with anxiety or, you know, they're dealing with somebody, a loved one, their partner, that, you know what, damn, they have anxiety. And do we feed into that or, you know, and making it worse or can we help with that situation? That doesn't mean they have anxiety that we should be disrespected or their anxiety has them get angry all the time at us and call us names and everything else but you know what we can't stick up for ourselves. that's not right either it's a give and take and it's a balancing to be able to look at the situation where you know what you know what i'm going to stand up for myself and there's nothing wrong with that it's a again i want people to be able to have self-respect and self-love even if they're caring for their loved ones or you know dealing with anxiety or in bad times you still got a right to command respect, to command love, right? And not to be dogged out or treated like crap because of a certain situation. Yes, the stress of an illness and losing our temper, that happens. We can understand that. However, can we work on those aspects and be able to look at it? You know what? I'm not going to tolerate you talking to me. I know you have cancer. I know the anxiety. I'm here for you but you're not going to treat me this way. There's nothing wrong with that. And that is not, oh, you're being selfish. You don't care about me. And they'll flip the script on you. No. You know what? I understand that, but you're not going to manipulate me because of that. I love you and I'm here for you. However, you're not going to treat me like shit. Okay? Um, so it's a very, very big, um, very, you know, it, it, it's not easy. Okay. Uh, Amy, you mentioned addiction in jail for a felony or compulsive jail time is my limit. Face tattoos wouldn't even get my number. You know what? I'm, Amy, I'm glad I don't have any face tattoos. No. <laughs> you know, everybody's got their thing. Some people are attracted to face tattoos. You know what? That, that's okay. Um, an addiction or in jail for a felony or compulsive jail time is my limit. I have my own limits. We all should have our own limits. There is nothing wrong with that, people. I'm tell it's not selfish having your limits. And like I said, you know, mine might be, I might have very, you know, very short limits, if you will, when it comes to addiction, you know, jail time, felon, that type of stuff, you know, habitual offender, habitual, you know, relapse addiction, all that aspects, where, you know, someone with cancer, you know, I, it's a different thing. And you know what? You can call me a hypocrite. James threw him out there. You know, maybe I'm being a hypocrite. No, not at all. We all should have our standards and our limitations about, you know, what we're going to deal with and what we're not going to deal with. And is it self-inflicted versus something out of our lover's control? You know, that's a big thing. And we have to look at that. And again, everybody is different. Shauna, I commented earlier about something I went through. You may have missed or it didn't post. You know what, Shauna? Um, <clears throat> it probably didn't. It probably posted, Shauna, but on the feed when I'm doing the live show and looking at it, I don't get. I don't get all the. Um, I don't get all the feeds. So let me really quick try to find it on my phone. Then maybe I can uh, address it. But if you can maybe copy and paste that, that would be awesome because I want to see. If I can uh, find it, you know what? I might not even be able to find it on my phone, okay? My underlying illness, I know Emily mentioned, my underlying illness also causes anxiety and depression. And a lot of it, you're right. I can't find it, Sean. I'm sorry. If you could post it, copy and paste it, that would be cool. Devin's in the house. Welcome. <clears throat> can I get a quick recap of what we are talking about? It won't let me start from the beginning. You might be able to refresh your screen, Devin. We're talking about bad times, and real quick, you know, what? How much would you tolerate? You know, what would you go through to be there through the bad times? Say a chronic illness, um, a chronic disease, maybe an addiction, 
uh, maybe your boyfriend, lover, whatever, is in and out of jail all the time. Do you have limits? So we're talking about that and being able to look at the elements. Are you able to, you know, would you be there? Should you be there? And it's very subjective. So, you know, that's what we're talking about, Devin. And welcome. Yeah. Nice always having you here, too. Um, yes, that is great advice, James. Was wondering if anyone had personal, like, exercises, mental or physical, that can help me without meds. Emily, I'm going to give you <coughs> with the anxiety. And I, I miss your post. I can't go back, so I'm sorry. Um, I miss maybe what you're going through. And I know a lot of medical conditions can create anxiety and depression. It's uh, one of those things, you know, psychosomatic, when you're dealing with a chronic illness, um, it wears on you. It wears your body out. It wears you out emotionally, mentally. And then that's, you know, the depression kicks in, anxiety kicks in, and I get it. So it's very difficult. There's some things that are very, very quick. And I mentioned, you know, show periodically throughout the show. Hold on. <clears throat> Sorry. <coughs> My voice is gone. So, Emily, very quick things with anxiety. When you're having an anxiety attack, there are a few things to do. Now, everyone talks about the breathing aspect, <laughs> you know, hyperventilating. You can breathe in fast, but the big thing is you want to exhale, okay? <gasps> you want to exhale as slow as possible. That's going to, and just focus, do not focus on anything but your breathing. You slow the exhale as much as possible, okay? And that is going to be one thing that can help you, and it's going to take your brain, it's going to focus on the breathing, the slow, the exhale. It's, your brain is going to focus and sort of get distracted away from the anxiety, okay? So that is one way that's going to help it. Another aspect is make a fist, okay? You relax. Make a fist, relax. Or hold a fist, I should say, hold it for about five seconds, okay? I went fast, but hold it for five seconds, relax. You do this maybe about ten times. Everybody's different, okay? What's going to happen, the same thing with the slow breathing is, you know what? Your brain's going to focus on your fists and sort of distract you from the anxiety, okay? And the great thing to do, you know, you can do this. And as you slow the exhale, slowly open your hands. Take a breath, clench, slow your exhale, and slow release. Your brain will focus on this and help you relax, okay? You can do the same aspect with curling your toes. You know, if you're around people, you don't want to make a fist, I get that. You know what? That's only, you know, if you're in private, I get that. But you can curl your toes and no one's going to see, right? If you have sandals on, flip-flops, so what? You know what? No one's going to really look. But curl your toe. You hold your toes curled. I'm not talking during great sex, okay? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but you look at, you know, curl your toes, hold them, just like the fist. Relax them and slow your exhale. That's going to distract you, okay? Another aspect is, it, this one's a little bit more tricky, Okay? Not really tricky. It's easy. I want you to write on a piece of paper. You want to keep it maybe in your purse or maybe in your car, at home, by your bed, on a counter, in a couple different places, okay? You want to write 1 through 15 on a piece of paper. Hold on. Don't do it yet. But you want to write 1 to 15, write them in a whole bunch of abstract order. Do not write 1, 2, 3. Write them, you know, write 3, 11, 8. You know, 15, 1, write them in a whole bunch of or different orders, okay? Have those papers near you because when you go into, an, you know, a panic attack or uh, anxiety attack, you know, get very, your brain, again, it has a hard time. It wants to put those in order. So it's going to focus on putting them in order. And when you put them in all order, your brain is going to focus on trying to focus on those numbers, okay? So what happens? It distracts again from the anxiety. Those are maybe you know three or four quick little things that can help you decrease the panic and decrease the anxiety, okay? Those are some quick things that can help with that. Remember, slow the exhale, the fists, relax, the toes, the same thing. 
and the numbers, you know, 1 to 15. You can do 1 to 10, 1 to 20, but just write them in a whole bunch of different orders. Don't write them in order, okay? Because your brain's going to focus and remember them. You want to write them in different orders so it tricks your brain into, wait a minute, this is... This isn't right. It's going to distract your brain from the anxiety and help you calm down a little bit, okay? Um, Cynthia, you mentioned that is very true, James. We see so many people being improperly diagnosed or diagnosed with one condition when there is often another condition that goes along with it. Cynthia, you are absolutely correct, and I agree. And Shauna brought this up earlier, and Emily too, which has been awesome, that, you know, a medical condition... Um, you know, diabetes, high blood pressure can create a lot of problems, right? Your thyroid aspect can create a lot of issues. We want to get to underlying issues. And unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of people, and James mentioned, you know, relationship therapists. There's a lot of people in this field, counselor, that don't even look at other possibilities. It's just a mental, a psychological thing. They don't look at it could be something else causing it okay so james you brought that up emily did as well shauna cynthia absolutely and i know and i know cynthia knows me and you know whatever um you know she i'm always looking at other other medical issues if it's a medical issue i want that taken care of that you know and then maybe you don't have to come and see me. Maybe that's an issue. Maybe it's testosterone levels. Maybe your th thyroid's out of whack. Maybe your um, estrogen levels are whacked. You know, maybe something else is going on that is causing your anxiety symptoms. Thyroid, oh my God. Thyroid and sugar issues, you know, blood pressure issues can create a lot of issues that mass anxiety, depression. So I always ask people, you know, if they're doing this, when was the last time you had blood work done? Oh my God, Greg, I'm sick of needles. I don't want needles. So you look at those, you know, it's one of those things that, you know what, we want to rule out any medical complications because if it's medical and no matter how much I try to help you in counseling and therapy, um, it might not help you because it's a medical issue. So it's very, very crucial. We need to rule out anything that is... Um, that could be a medical complication that is breathing in, um, you know, breathing in. I'm looking at James Pulse. I'm sorry. So you're looking at those elements to look at, you know what, it could be a medical problem causing the anxiety, the depression. So I want to rule out any medical complications because, like I said, no matter how good I am, I'm bragging. No, I'm very humble. Um, you know what, I want to... If, if it's a medical condition, we can get that taken care of. You get that taken care of. Maybe therapy isn't needed, okay? I know I'm a bad business person, but I'd rather have you live your life. And you know what? Like I said, you can go through therapy, and all of a sudden it's a medical condition, and you're still dealing with the aspect for, heaven forbid, three months, six months. I, I know people for a year, and you find out it's a damn medical condition, and that's where the therapist should be let's face it, hit over the head because you need to look at those aspects. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't or they want the money, and which is unethical, okay? I want what's best for you out there, so I want to look at all those aspects, okay? Um, so, um, Shauna, you mentioned, what's that? I Hopefully I just co covered all those aspects. And I mentioned about you bringing up they can be caused by, you know, medical problems or underlying other issues causing the anxiety and the depression. So that's why I threw your name out there um, along with uh, Emily and James and Cynthia, you know, Sophia and everything else that, you know, you're talking about. And I know it's very difficult um, that you go through this. Um, Shauna Marie, uh, too often a person is not uh, that at that point where they are able to cognitively intervene in their own anxiety. You're absolutely right, James, but for any who are, if not already doing so, try looking up called cognitive mindfulness. Several people I know, James, you're right, cognitive mindfulness um, is a huge thing. And mindfulness, believe it or not, has been around for years. It's been around for 20 years. 30 years mindfulness and it's getting renamed and they're putting it with the cognitive aspect and as Shauna knows Cynthia knows a lot of people know um, I'm not a huge 
my theoretical, counseling theoretical, psychological theoretical is experiential, existential, okay? I throw it out there. However, do I use cognitive strategies, behavioral strategies? You have to do something to make a change, right? I'm all for that. But I'm huge on our emotions, our feelings. If we don't feel a certain way within us, in our heart, in our soul, in our gut instinct, if we don't feel that, chances are it's not going to last. So the anxiety is going to, it's the anxiety coming, uh, you know, in essence of us being insecure with whatever, okay? We were maybe raped. We were sexually abused. So the anxiety comes up because we feel you know, we're not good enough, that we're a piece of meat, we're not worthy. All those those feelings inside of us, and yes, the kind of mindfulness, as James said, it does help. It is very, it does help a lot. But the mindfulness is almost like being aware. It's almost like a self-meditation aspect, and that comes with the breathing aspect I mentioned, the same aspect with, uh, you know, making a fist and all that aspect. So, James, thanks for bringing that up. And no, that's huge. And I, you know, I want whatever works for people. Okay, um, what I do, you know, apply whatever help people might. And it's not going to work for everybody. But you know, you have to do what works. Um, you know what? What works for you and what works. And you're going to have some counselors out there. Therapy. Yeah, I'm throwing a lot of us under the bus. That you know what? This is all they do, and you know what? Damn it, you are going to use what I'm teaching you, no matter if it works for you or not. And if, you don't, if it don't work for you, then you're wrong. Then you're a client that is, oh, my God, reluctant, right? Reluctant to treatment. You know what? They're, you're not working as hard. Maybe that treatment orientation doesn't work for you. Oh, boy, we're getting all over the task about going through, you know. So think about, you know, what's good, what's bad, now all the those aspects okay Sabrina you mentioned I got too attached when they would die you know it affected me too much oh it's hard and you know you know if people hospice nurses um, I give them a world of credit not only hospice nurses hospice workers and people you know nursing homes getting attached to people um, and you know let's face it a lot of older people they die in nursing homes so you get attached and it's hard it's very difficult and I don't want people to get so desensitized where they stop caring. So I'm going to say good night. Thank you for viewing, listening, <coughs> excuse me, to the show. People listening for the first time, I definitely appreciate it. Um, but look about, you know, it's very subjective. It's not a right or wrong. You know what? My, my thing about in bad times is, you know what? You need to be a partner. And, you know, Susan mentioned her and her husband, and I know this for a fact, they have each other's back, they're there for each other. The problem is, if you're there for your partner and your partner is never there for you, you know what? Maybe you're in the wrong relationship. I'm going to be blunt about that. Maybe your partner needs to get kicked in the ass, you know what? Or maybe that's, they're being selfish, or maybe there's anxiety about being there for you, they can't handle it emotionally, see? It, maybe I look at why aren't they there for you because emotionally they can't handle it. Maybe they can be emotionally stronger to look at that. So these are all elements to look at and to get help. Come and see me. I do Skype sessions, online sessions if you're not in Metro Detroit area. You know, these are things we can look at. Um, you know, what is causing your partner not to be there because they don't want to or is it, you know what, because they're uncomfortable. They're afraid to see you sick. They're afraid to see you uh, you know, maybe disabled or debilitated, and it, you know, they need to get away from that because emotionally they can't handle it. It hurts them too much. So we need to look at those elements. Is that a problem, or is it just that they're selfish and you know what? It's all about them. They could care less. They don't want to be there. In those situations, then you need to say, you know what? Then maybe I need to not maybe I need to be with someone that's going to be there for me as much as I'm there for them. Okay, thank you again, everybody else. I, James, Shauna, Cynthia, oh my God, Emily, you name it. Um, Sabrina, Sophia, freaking everybody that tuned in tonight. Shauna, again, a huge uh, heartfelt uh, deep wishes to you and your fellow Texans um, with the flood situation from Harvey. Okay, much love and peace. To everybody out there, let's keep Texas and Louisiana in our thoughts and in our wishes, people. 
Much love to everybody out there, okay? Peace. Everybody take care, and thanks again for listening to the Art of Relationships radio show. Check out my website, please, theartartofrelationships.org. Thank you so much. Take care, people.